Welcome everyone. And we're going to today's talk, looking at social media and crisis management. And it's going to be an awesome talk, but let's always, as we always start in at the Ryerson with the land acknowledgement in that Toronto is the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon is a treaty between the Ashinaabe, Mississauga and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. My name is Dr. Wayne Smith and I'm your host today. And today will be this presentation is brought to you by the Ryerson Institute for Hospitality and Tourism Research. Our mission is to facilitate and conduct research of scholarly value and significance to the tourism and hospitality field and to mobilize knowledge through the traditional and non-traditional channels. Research conducted through the Institute is on, is on a broad array of topics, including sustainable tourism, destination management, and marketing, indigenous tourism, consumer behavior, and organizational behavior. For more information about our current and past research, please visit our website, www.htmresearch.ca. We also have a new podcast called Behind the Study that you can listen to. Each episode features a different researcher and explores their pursuit of knowledge and motivation in conducting research on particular topics. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or on our own website. Well, let's welcome our special guest star today, Dr. Danielle Barb. Today's keynote speaker is Dr. Danielle Barb. Dr. Barb is a lecturer at Northumbria University in the UK. She recently earned her PhD from the University of Florida, where she is also a, a director for the Tourism Crisis Management Institute initiative. Sorry, She specializes in social media, including crisis management, influencer marketing, and destination marketing. Dr. Barb is also an alumni of the Ted Rogers School of Hospitality and Tourism Management. I spent some time and I read a couple of her papers today and she is very intelligent and super insightful in this topic. So let's give her a big welcome to our talk today. Dr. Barb, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I think Brian's just gonna get my slides up there. So yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thank you everyone for coming. And also thank you to Wayne and Brian and HTM Research for having me here to do this talk. Um, I guess it's a relatively timing timely topic talking about crisis communication and tourism as we're facing currently one of the biggest crises in our industry, which is of course the global pandemic we're all facing today. Um, I am, as mentioned, a Ryerson alumni. So just wait until this, that gets up there. Perfect, thank you. As mentioned, yeah, I went to Ryerson. I was an HTM student, um, class of 2015. And then in 2015, I moved over to Florida to do my PhD. And now I am currently in Newcastle, England, uh, Newcastle upon Tyne in the UK, where I am a lecturer in digital marketing. Um, however, Ryerson's always my home. I love it there. And I'm going to be, I usually come back to, I'm from Toronto area originally. So I'm usually going to be back there, hopefully for Christmas, if travel is allowed for me to return home. Um, so let me get started. My area, my focus is on social media and tourism crisis communication. Am I able to switch the slides or perfect? Excellent. So today's topic, I'm just going to do a brief introduction into crisis communication. Um, I will talk about social media for tourism crisis communication, a bit about my research, and then some best strategies, in, particularly in relation to COVID-19 recovery. Okay, so before I start my research, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a background as to why I got into this area. Um, I actually, I love that this is um, hosted by HTM Research because that is where my entire journey began. Um, if it wasn't for working at the Research Institute, I wouldn't even be where I am today. And it all started with social media based research. Now, when I moved to Florida, I found myself stuck in a situation where I was, of course, impacted by an incoming hurricane. And I just moved to Florida. I didn't know anyone. I've never been in a hurricane before. Obviously, living coming from Canada, we don't experience hurricanes. <laughs> and so I didn't really know what to do. But luckily, the university was really informative. And the University of Florida was sending us constant um, emails regarding what we need to do to keep safe. Uh, we, they had a website where they were updating it constantly and they were directing us to which news sources were providing the most up-to-date information, particularly to our area, which was more of the North Florida, which isn't really affected. There was no 
well, there's some very seldom evacuation orders where I was in Gainesville, um, and it wasn't very coastal either. But at the same time, they were telling us whether we needed to evacuate, if we need to um, do any sort of procedures. And I was really thankful for that. And I started to think to myself, if I didn't have the university to provide me with this information, I would have no idea what to do or where to go for that information. And I started thinking, you know, Florida is one of the largest tourism destinations in the world, especially Orlando and especially Miami. And if people are traveling here for the purpose of tourism, especially from places maybe in Canada or elsewhere in the world, Europe, it's one of the biggest for international travel. Are they getting this information? Do they know how to get that information, where they can go to for that information and who's communicating to these tourists on site? And so I started to do a little bit of research and I said, okay, well, maybe the tourism organization, the destination management organizations are communicating to the tourists and telling them what they need to do. So I looked on their Facebook page, I looked on their Instagram, their Twitter accounts. Um, the only thing that had any information was their website. And so there's a knock at my door, which ignore that for a second. Um, so the only information that was there was on their website. And so of course, um, the next thing that I did was I started looking at maybe the local tourism boards. I started looking on at any information and I found that there was absolutely no information at all being provided particularly to the tourists. And this was quite alarming. And so I started to think that this would be maybe my area and my focus of research. And of course, from then it has been my area of research ever since. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a bit of a background as to what is crisis communication. Um, I know that there's a generally large variation of different audiences here. Um, I know some of you are maybe professors, some of you are researchers, some of you are maybe undergraduate students who have never even heard of this concept before. So I'm trying to cater this presentation to a wide variety of people. Um, so please, if you are unfamiliar or if you're familiar, just bear with me while I go through some of the concepts. But if there's anything that um, maybe is a bit too complex that you want me to um, explain or clarify, please let me know, write it down. And at the end of the presentation, I'll be happy to do that for you. So crisis communication is the collection, processing, and disseminating of information required to address the crisis situation. It is the ongoing process of creating shared meaning among those between groups, communities, individuals, agencies, with the purpose of preparing for and reducing, limiting, and responding to threats and harm. Thank you. Okay, so now that we know what crisis communication is, essentially it's communicating during a crisis, right? For a variety of different reasons. Now, crises are very impactful to the tourism industry. When a crisis occurs in the tourism industry, what that can do is it can cause a negative perception on that destination, right? It can tarnish the reputation that that destination has, whether it's something like a hurricane, whether it's a terrorist attack, whether it's maybe an increase in crime, um, or a global pandemic, right? So if they're not handling that pandemic correctly, there's an increased number of cases. I know a lot of people right now, especially over here where I am, they do not wanna to go to the US at all because of the way that they're handling that situation, right? So it's tarnishing the reputation. Now, the purpose of crisis communication is to find a way to reduce the impact that that crisis has had on that destination and allow it to bounce back and become more resilient to these types of situations. What I focus on is not so much that reputation management, that's been a wide variety of research. My focus is on immediate communication as a crisis is unfolding. How do we communicate to the tourists to keep them safe during a crisis situation? And so when a crisis occurs, it's critical that tourists receive accurate and timely crisis related information, especially when information is related to how they should respond to an impending crisis. However, this is different than it is in any other organization. Typically, when we talk about crisis communication, it's focused a lot on organizational crises. So it could be things like um, maybe consumer activism where there is um, a lot of people maybe boycotting a company or they're not happy with the way that a company's marketing campaign went. But in tourism, it's completely different because tourists are this unique audience. They're not consumers. They often don't, are, they're not somebody who's familiar with the organization. They often lack that crisis related knowledge they may not know where to turn to for information. They may not be connected to that crisis communication network. So let's say, even if you don't know where to turn to for information, if you do a search on Twitter, you may not be connected to the local network of people who would be able to provide you with the accurate information. And then of course, it may not follow local news channels, emergency agencies, and so on, on social media. 
So the role of crisis communication in hospitality and tourism, it's really twofold. First and foremost is to maintain the safety of the tourists. And second is to maintain the positive perceptions of the destination. There's been a ton of research, as I mentioned before, on reputation management, right? How do we take this negative image of a destination after it's experienced a crisis and repair it to make people think more positively about it again? If a terrorist attack has happened in London, how do we go about and maybe change our marketing strategy so people think that London is safe again? However, the role of crisis communication shouldn't emphasize so much about the post-crisis impact and reducing the negative image, but more so on how do we keep them safe? How do we communicate to this unique audience in a way that's not like we would communicate to local residents of the area, right? Because it's a very unique, vulnerable population. How do we communicate to tourists? How do we get that communication to them? And how do we keep them safe by providing them with the necessary information so that they know what to do in this situation? Um, what makes it so complex, however, in tourism is that our industry is faced by a multitude of crises. I just named a few, right? Terrorist attacks, uh, COVID-19, hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes. Um, so how do we find a way that we can communicate depending on which of these different types of crises arise? And also it's an open system. It doesn't just pack, impact one organization. Tourism, as we know, is a set of interlinking organizations. There's transportation, hotels, airlines, the government agencies, policy and planning that goes into place, as well as the DMO that helps manage and market that destination. So if one area, one of those industries are impacted, it impacts the entire system, which makes it really unique to our industry. So this is where social media can come into play, and especially in terms of real-time immediate communication. I'll let you just take a look at this briefly. Social media has a ton of benefits for crisis communication. And one of the main ones is the fact that it's one of the only tools we can use to communicate to tourists in real time and in order and allow, sorry, our communication to reach the widest possible audience within a very short period of time. If we use things like mass media, we maybe only get, are getting a particular target audience, but if we use social media and that gets shared and shared and shared, it has the ability to reach maybe millions and millions of people. It's free, it enables a two-way dialogue where we can answer questions. It allows other people to also communicate what they're experiencing at the same time, which is known as citizen journalism. It can allow some humanization to the organization and it can be accessible anywhere that an internet connection exists. So it's a really effective tool for crisis communication. Perfect. So I'm gonna briefly describe some of the uses of social media in times of a crisis. In a, there's really three crisis stages. There's pre-crisis, during crisis, and a post-crisis. Um, I'll explain more of this in the next slide. I have a really fun and fancy model. Um, I love models, so you'll see a few of those over here, but I'll do my best to kind of uh, explain what those models are really indicating. So pre-crisis, there's prevention, preparation, and mitigation. These are the top priorities during a crisis. In this stage, the communication that should be sent out are messages that provide information about potential crises to help build resilience in the event it occurs. Even if it's something like COVID-19, we're not expecting tourists to travel quite yet, but if they do, let's provide them with some of the protocols that take place within our destination. So if tourists are traveling from um, England over into Toronto, then the Toronto Tourism Board should provide them information with, okay, where can they go? What are what hotels are open that provide them with a place to quarantine for 14 days upon arrival? What um, precautions are they expecting to have at the airport in terms of wearing masks, hand sanitizing stations and so on, right? How do we help prevent um, our current situation from getting worse if people are starting to travel once again? Once a crisis is unfolded, there is this immediate crisis response. We need to respond immediately and explain what they need to do and how they should do it. This is where action-oriented items exist. Let's take the example of a terrorist attack, right? If a terrorist attack occurs in a destination, of course, we have the media and we have the government officials and police immediately responding saying, please stay clear of this area, but the tourism organization should do the same and they should provide that information to the tourists and say, this has happened within this destination or within this area. It is best at this time to maybe stay in your hotel, right? Providing them with a set of instructions of what they can do to keep safe. And then post-crisis, it's all about managing the effects of those that are arrivals due to the crisis and repairing, and of course, maintaining those relationships with the stakeholders, which are the tourists, the suppliers, 
and other destinations in the region. Okay, this is my fun model I was talking about here. Um, I know it looks very complex and fancy. I'll kind of just break it down to a bit. So we have those three crisis stages I was just talking about, right? In the blue, this is what the tourists are doing to communicate to the actual, um, to the tourism organization. So it's not just a one-way communication. Crisis communication, particularly on social media, is a two-way dialogue. So pre-crisis, while we're communicating information about the risks and helping them reduce the risk, we're also monitoring what the tourists are saying to help prevent any risk from escalating. We're monitoring and gathering, gathering sorry, that user-generated content from the tourists. And what the tourists are providing is they're sharing information, knowledge, and experiences uh, when they've been in crisis events. So that's the external communication. It's also critical as well that, our, that tourism organizations communicate within each other as well. So those transportation sector, the hospitality sector, the destination, um, any of the suppliers that go along with that should be sharing information with one another, allowing this collaborative decision-making and helping identify the potential risks to the area so that they can all work together to bounce back quicker. And that's all part of that crisis communication process. During a crisis, of course, there is this real-time monitoring and management management of the situation. There's citizen journalism and crowdsourcing, seeing what they're saying and allowing us to use that information to help provide communication back to them. And from the tourist side, we're providing real-time updates and instructional communication. Tourists are also communicating with one another during these times. They're sharing information about what's happening to them with their friends and family, um, which is part of that citizen journalism. Maybe they're also doing volunteerism. We've seen this a lot with hurricane situations where local residents will open their doors and allow tourists to come in if they have no place to stay, if their hotel is being shut down. So this is one way that um, the citizens and the local people are working with the tourists, the tourism industry as well during a crisis. And then within the actual internal communication, there is this coordination of actions, resource mobilization, message consistency, and reducing any of the rumors. I'm sure many of you have seen the famous photo of a hurricane in Florida and there being a shark in the middle of the streets. It's like this photo that went viral and they share it every time there's a hurricane saying, oh, this is what Florida looks like right now, when in fact that is not the case. So how do we reduce any misinformation or rumors that happen? And then of the course, there's that post-crisis stage where we do a damage assessment, um, we repair our reputation, but we also monitor the sentiment from the tourists. Are they happy with the way that the destination uh, managed the crisis situation? How do we help gather the information from their opinions in order to help with our recovery process? And of course, this is a cycle. So it involves adaptive learning every time a crisis occurs. And when I say every time, because as much as we want to reduce or limit our impact or a crisis from happening, it, it's almost inevitable. We can't prevent natural disaster from happening. We could not have prevented um, to a certain degree COVID-19 from happening, right? So we have to start being proactive and coming up with these plans, knowing that a crisis is likely to happen within our destination. Okay. So I've done a few studies, as I mentioned, I started to be a little bit interested in crisis communication. So I wanted to see what the tourism industry is currently doing. So I've done studies on um, terrorism attacks in six, or sorry, five European cities. So it was the two London attacks. It was the Paris, um, Paris attacks, the Nice when the car drove through um, the crowds during the, um, festival in Nice. It was in Barcelona and then also in Brussels when there was that bombing in the airport. So I wanted to see what the tourism destination management organization did in terms of responding to this. And they said very little. Um, there are certain cases where, for example, in Nice, the tourism organization was very communicative on Twitter, which was great, especially during the um, attacks unfolding. They're providing information to people of where they can go if they need help, who to call. However, there are other very poor cases, like say, for example, Visit London, who as soon as the terrorist attacks happened, both incidents, they went completely silent for an entire week and didn't say anything. And when they finally started re um, doing their social media pages, all their messages were, our hearts and thoughts are with the victims of the attack. There was nothing really relevant to crisis communication. Can you go back to? Thank you. Um, and so the next study we did was also on Orlando Hotel's Twitter response. So we looked not just at terrorist attacks like the Pulse nightclub shooting, but also a disease outbreak like Zika and then the alligator snatching of the young boy on Disney property. So I thought, okay, well, if the destinations are not saying anything, maybe it's the hotels who are communicating. So I looked at about 
200 hotels in the Orlando area to see if they were communicating about any of these incidents to provide information to their uh, respondents and their guests. And again, there was absolutely nothing to do with any of these situations except for the Pulse nightclub shooting where at the end of the day, they said our hearts and thoughts are with the victims of these attacks. Those were the only messages that were ever sent out regarding these incidents. And then the last study we did was looking at hurricanes. As I mentioned, we looked in South Carolina and North Carolina. We looked at both the state tourism offices as well as the local tourism offices like Visit Outer Banks, Visit Charlotte or Charleston, sorry, um, Myrtle Beach. And we looked to see if maybe how communication was flowing from maybe the top down throughout the hurricane information. There was some, and we looked at multiple different platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Instagram had no communication about the crisis. Twitter had some messages, but Facebook was the prominent tool that we found. Um, but of course, again, they were not providing so much information as much as sharing um, information that was provided from those um, governmental sources. Okay, now we can continue. So this got me saying, maybe the reason for this, maybe the reason that there's this lack of communication, particularly on social media from the tourism industry, because they're not really aware of how to communicate. So um, I've started to create this crisis communication model for the tourism industry. And I told you I love models. So I'm sorry that I'm presenting all of, <laughs> all of these models, but it's been a fun process. So this is actually a very basic communications process. So if we eliminate everything after the word message, um, that's pretty much the basic communication process. You have the source, the media, and the message. The source could be me. I'm communicating to you about crisis communication right now. That's my message. And the media is Zoom, right? So there's all these different basic communication tools. And so what my research has been for the last, oh gosh, seems like forever, I want to say five years, um, has been coming up with a way that we can optimize each one of these elements in the communications process more effectively so that we can ensure that we are communicating to the tourists um, regarding crisis situations and optimizing our ability to do that. So um, I'm gonna go through each of these in elements, but if you look at the behavioral intentions, the end goal is really to change the perceptions of safety from being something negative to something positive with the hopes that the tourist may potentially remain in the destination, recommend uh, the destination to others, spread positive word of, word of mouth, or return to that destination in the future. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, so the main goal and the source element was who is the spokesperson during a crisis? So the source is the person or organization from which communication derives. It's the sender of information. Um, but when people are seeking information, so the tourist seeking information, it's the person or organization where they're looking to obtain that information from, right? So it can be two ways. Me as the, the communicator, I am the source, I'm providing a message to you. But as the tourist, the source is the person they're looking to go to for information. And in a traditional sense, the source has several factors that make it considered a credible source. And one of those are authenticity, right? Are they, or let's, in a certain way, are they, is it the authentic source? Is it the true source of information? Credibility, are they the person who needs to be communicating? Do they have a level of authority in the matter, right? For example, a government would have a high level of authority versus maybe an influencer, like a travel influencer would have very little authority when communicating during a crisis. Um, other elements in terms of the source are, are they um, trustworthy? Are they perceived to be trustworthy? Are they likable? So there's all these different elements. With social media, there's a lot of issues that arrive when it comes to the source. And the main one is that it's very hard to narrow down who that true source of information is. When we see things on social media, we may have believe it right away. I've seen so many times people sharing messages saying um, certain things. And I, it makes me question, is this true or not? I'm sure you've seen the same. You know, you read something that somebody shared on social media and you're like, I don't know, it seems, a little bit inaccurate, but it's hard to know where that information is coming from. Where did the person that shared it get that information? Is it something that they screenshot off Twitter? Well, where did that person get that information from? So it's really difficult to narrow down that true source of information, which leads to, of course, misinformation and disinformation, things that are inaccurate or just plain wrong. Um, social media also has opinion leaders who allow us to pass that information through um, people who are influencers or lead our audiences to perceive things in a certain way. Um, and also network efficiency. Our ability to get a message out on social media is limited by our, our number of followers. I'm not likely to get a lot of people to read my message because I only have, let's say, 100 followers on Instagram. I think it's more than that. 
<laughs> but for example, if I only had a hundred followers on Instagram, my message on Instagram is unlikely to get to more than those hundred people. Um, but if I had 500, then maybe it would get to 500 people who maybe have the ability to share that, which can get to a larger and a larger audience, which means I have a very efficient network. Next slide, please. So these are the source factors on social media. The likelihood for our message to be received by the tourists is based on the degree of influence during a crisis, which is based on the number of followers, the level of authority, the strength of our network and centrality. And centrality just means how centralized am I within my network? Am I leaning maybe too far to the right, too far to the left? Then I'm only likely to get that particular audience. So that was my main goal of one of my research. And um, we found that the best way to communicate as a source during a crisis situation is to go through the people who have the most followers. Our destination is not likely to do that. So if we, of course, direct our, our tourists, sorry, the guests in our destination, if we direct them to maybe things like CNN or in Canada, it would be maybe um, CBC or Global, one of these networks where maybe people have more followers and we're able to get that information out there. Um, if they're tourists and they're not followers with that, maybe we can ask some of our global partners to help share that message and say, if you're currently traveling in Canada, please make sure you follow this source of information so that the network efficiency is stronger and we can use our partnerships through social media to share that information to ensure that the message is received by tourists. Thank you. The next part is the medium. So this is where my marketing background comes in. Um, when we talk about the medium, of course I have here, the medium is the message. Some people have said it's more important the medium than the message itself. If they are, and the reason for that actually, let me just take a step back, is if we have crafted the most beautiful crisis message, we, it has all the elements in typical communications theory that says that people are going to follow this message if it's read. Well, it's pretty useless if we're not getting the message to that audience. If we're not using the right medium so that they can actually get that message, then that message becomes absolutely useless. So the medium is actually key. And on social media, we talk about social media as being one thing. It's not, media is plural. There's multiple different platforms that exist in social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, um, if you see here, Skype, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok now, LinkedIn. So we have multiple different mediums. So how do we know which one is the best to use? And we do we just use the same message across all these different platforms with the hope that they're gonna obtain that information in the same way. So if you look again, I have another model. I'm sorry, I love my models. Um, these are the things that we found to be influential factors that uh, help with selection of media choice. So it depends on the demographics. So this comes back every time you want to put anything on social media, you have to think to yourself, is this platform my target audience? Are the people who use Snapchat the target audience of the tourists in my destination or the guests at my hotel? Are these people using Snapchat? Are they using Facebook? And if the answer is no, then maybe it's not an efficient tool to use. Maybe you want to focus on things that your audience does you like maybe it's Twitter. And so what they use is based on their demographics, it's based on their social media behavior. Um, we've also found it's based on their travel behavior. So the people who um, are traveling more frequently actually tend to use more social media platforms. And I think the reason for this is based on the fact that people who travel more frequently are likely to have more global connections out there. And the people who they communicate or connect with overseas maybe don't use um, Facebook Messenger, but maybe they use um, WhatsApp instead, right? WhatsApp is one of these things that a lot of people use when they're traveling because it's one of those communication tools you can use all over the place. And so maybe that based on their travel behavior, they're tending to have more social media platforms to keep in contact with the people that they meet overseas versus people who aren't frequent travelers tend to stick to maybe only the platforms that they know um, as they don't have that much of a global um, friend base. And it's also based on their crisis behavior. We found that people who have actually been in a crisis situation before are actually more likely to use more social media platforms if they're put into a crisis situation again, um, because they've experienced that and they know that they have to look at a variety of different tools in order to get that information. Um, I'm actually going to skip most of my slides here, but I'll stick to this one. I just love the way that we uh, conducted this study, we used kind of like a 360 VR video where we tried to simulate a terrorist incident. Um, we did it, of course, under the bounds of the research ethics board. So <laughs> that was fine. It was allowed to be done. But we tried to simulate somebody who was, you know, in London and we said, okay, alert, a terrorist attack has just occurred within your immediate region. What are you likely to do? So if you go to the next slide there, 
Um, we asked them, of course, what platform are you most likely to go to? Facebook, of course, was the number one platform followed by Facebook Messenger, Twitter, Instagram, WhatsApp, Reddit, and other. Um, you could see Snapchat, WhatsApp, Reddit, and other not likely to be used. I do, I should say that this is a US-based study in American context. Americans don't tend to use WhatsApp, but I feel like if I were to conduct this in um, Canada or even in the UK, WhatsApp would probably be one of the top ones in comparison. Next slide. Um, I'm going to skip this one, but this was just asking how do these individual characteristics influence their media, media choice during a terrorist attack? Um, it does influence it. Most, the biggest thing and the biggest differences were within race, of course, and then also age. Instagram was more for the younger generation. Twitter was more for the older and so on. Uh, next slide. Okay. Next slide again, please. Okay. This is the one I think is really important. Um, how does tourist intended social media use during a terrorist attack dictate their channel selection? So the first thing we asked is, okay, you're in a crisis situation. What are you first likely to do? And the number one thing people said was search for information, right? This is all about this need for orientation. When people are faced in a situation where there's a lot of unknowns, their first instinct is to look it up, right? Look up what you're, what's happening. And so, right, one, and so one of the main things they're going to do this is use social media. And then the second thing they're likely to do is, of course, tell people they know, maybe post on social media, update their friends or family, um, post information about it, and do a safety check-in. So these were some of the main top behaviors. And if you go to the next slide as well, thank you. Uh, the number one thing that they were going to do to look for information was across all platforms, um, but Facebook was the most prominent for uh, posting information or offering assistance or doing the safety check-in. Instagram was more used for doing live video streams. It wasn't a common behavior, but if they did want to live video stream their terrorist attack, then they were going to do it on Instagram um, and tell people they know they were not likely to do a safety check-in for this. Um, and you can kind of see these are the top things that people would do based on each platform. So we actually found that the behavior that they're likely to do in a situation is based on their platform choice. Oh, sorry, their platform choice is based on the behavior that they're going to engage in. So I'm trying to, I'm gonna make this less complex now. Um, can we skip? A slide here. Excellent. Go to the next one. Okay, so this is my favorite study. Um, this is the one we did to look at the message and time on tourist sense of safety. So the thinking here was saying messages of empathy, does that really help us in a crisis situation? As I told you, all the studies that I've done previously, the main thing that we found were that all of the tourism industry was doing was providing messages of their thoughts and hearts are with the victims of these incidents or any of those affected by these incidents. And so in my opinion, coming from um, a communications perspective, empathy isn't always the best strategy. Of course, all the scholars and all the research in crisis communication does say that empathy is one of the top tools that we need to use, especially when we're not at fault for it, which is true. The tourism industry isn't at fault for most of the crisis situations that happen. We're not at fault for the way that COVID has impacted us in the tourism industry. We're not at fault for hurricanes that happen in Miami that of course devastated um, some areas or like we had um, recently in um, Bahamas as well. So the tourism industry is not at fault. So the crisis communication theory says, okay, then the best thing you can do is just apologize or send thoughts of empathy for those who are impacted. But that's not necessarily the most effective strategy because the first thing that tourism industry should do is provide information for those people on site to help keep them safe. So I wanted to test this. I wanted to see if my thought process was correct and say, is informational and action-oriented messages more impactful to the perceptions of safety at the destination than um, sending just messages of thoughts? Because those messages of thoughts and prayers are likely to maybe help them think more positively about the destination, right? Because they're using empathy to try and appeal to their audience. But at the same time, if they're providing information and they're telling people what to do, then the tourists are likely to perceive that as the tourism industry doing their due diligence to help keep them safe, which potentially can also increase their resilience to crises in the future. And then also the uh, thought process was the time. I also noticed that a lot of the tourism industry was communicating days afterwards or a week after the incident occurred. And so my whole focus is on proactive, immediate, timely communication. So I wanted to test to see if the time that the tourists or that the DMO, the destination management organization communicated to their audience, if that impacted um, the perceptions of safety. So if they communicated right away and said, okay, this is what just happened within the last hour, this is what you need to do, 
or if they communicated a day after, or if they communicated a week after, if that had any influence on the tourists at all. So really this study was saying, do the tourists actually care about crisis communication on social media? Next. So we used experiments design. This is really complex and I'm not gonna go through this too much, but we did do experiments design to see the time and the message type, if that assisted with um, the perceptions of safety at the destination. I have a little example here. I hope, I wish I, I should have made these larger, but you could see the messages that we had. So one of the messages was a terrorist attack occurred in London Bridge, avoid the area until further notice, locate a nearby office if you require immediate assistance. The other message was a terrorist attack occurred at London Bridge, circumstances are being assessed and officers are leading an investigation. And the last one is our thoughts are with those affected by the terrorist attack at London Bridge. So you can see the three different elements. The first one was um, instructional information. It provided not just information, but also instructions, right? Locate a nearby officer if you require immediate assistance. The next one was pure information. This is what happened. And the last one was empathetic. So we found that instructional messages delivered immediately increases the perceptions of safety at the destination. So my hypothesis was correct in this situation. Um, and so we recommend that destinations work with government agencies to provide immediate crisis communication that instructs visitors on how to keep safe in order to reduce the negative impacts on the destination. The second major finding was that informational messages do not influence safety perceptions. So just providing plain information is not enough. It needs to incorporate some sort of instructional message as well. Um, the other one was empathetic messages do increase perceptions of safety when the delivery is delayed. So the messages that they are currently doing when they're sending it a week later, right? That was the delayed or a day later did actually increase their perceptions of safety. So once the immediate crisis is over, the DMO can begin their recovery strategy focusing on empathy is one of our suggested strategies as well. And then perceptions of safety increase the likelihood to remain in the destination during a terrorist attack and decrease the likelihood to change travel plans or return home. So end of the day, if we provide instructional messages and then in the, in the immediate situation and then provide empathy later, that will increase perceptions of safety, which will then increase the likelihood for the tourists to either remain in the destination if the crisis has occurred or maybe change their travel plans. And in this situation, we focus on a terrorist attack. Um, our next stage of the research is to look at different types of crisis situations. And we have the benefit of being currently in a crisis situation, which makes it a little bit easier to study because people don't have to um, be simulated as if they are in like a terrorist attack. Now they can actually say, well, you're currently in COVID-19. Um, what can we do to uh, make you feel more safe about traveling? So that's kind of the next stage of this research, but we do have some recommendations based on the ones we found with the uh, terrorist study, terrorism study. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about COVID-19. I'm sure you've heard about this through many of your lectures and seminars that you've read or any other Honestly, anything you're reading, it's always about COVID-19 nowadays. I feel like we can't spend one day without hearing about it, which of course it's something that's continuously ongoing. So it's very important. In terms of the tourism industry, what makes this really unique is the fact that it's a disease outbreak. There's no tourism organization or destination directly at fault for the outbreak, as we mentioned. Um, however, the response to the crisis by the tourism industry may result in it being escalated. So um, if the tourism industry maybe leaves their doors open, they don't require people to quarantine, if they're not dealing with the situation effectively, then that can obviously increase the number of cases, which can increase, um, or sorry, yeah, sorry, increase the negative impacts of the destination, which I feel like the US is kind of a good example of that because at the beginning, they never closed their borders. Well, they did close their borders to an extent, but they were still allowing tourism to happen. Um, they weren't requiring face masks. When I traveled from, Florida into Toronto, this was in April. Um, so Toronto was very good with the whole lockdown when I first arrived. They actually checked up on me in my quarantine when I first arrived in Toronto, which I was not expecting um, to make sure I was like self isolating. But in Florida, I was on a full plane The even the flight attendants said, Oh, why are you wearing a mask? You don't need to wear a mask. And I was just completely um, surprised by the way that they were handling it. So I think that's one way that they may be done it negatively to make people perceive that their handling of the situation is bad and tourists to be maybe our future tourists coming into the US be less likely to want to travel there. And the one thing that makes this really unique is that it has a global impact. We've never experienced a situation before that's had an impact on such a wide extent. 
So some of the strategies that we have and recommendations for social media crisis communication is to pause, pause I can't speak anymore, <laughs> pause any planned initiatives um, that you may have. So if you are working within the industry and you have this big marketing initiative that you're about to um, portray, it's probably best to pause it because we don't know what the situation is going to be like. However, at the same time, it's important to not be silent continuously, post updates, and maybe provide some sort of um, humanistic approach and say, this is what um, our workers are doing while we're not providing um, services to you at this time, because of course the industry is shut down. It's also important to be proactive and communicate immediately, not to be reactive to any situation. Be transparent and consistent across platforms, but at the same time, cater the communication to the audience. If you're communicating on Facebook, use not just text, but use the photos and videos, try to capture the attention of that audience. And that's from a marketing perspective. Also in Instagram, of course, use visuals, but it's important that those visuals include the message because people are less likely to read captions than they are to actually be captured by the image itself. If you're to use Twitter, of course, use that updated information, continuously provide those updates because people are less likely to kind of scroll through your page to get the most immediate information. Um, and then maybe with um, Snapchat or even Instagram stories, providing just 30 second informative videos are the best way. So communicate or cater the communication to the audience and to the platform that you're communicating through. And that's a lot of words I can say in I guess the last 40 minutes. So thank you so much. I know that was a lot of information to withhold, uh, to hold on to, and I could definitely go more into the research. So I tried to, to cut it a bit short because I think that I, you may be more beneficial answering any questions that you guys have um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. It was a great talk. Anyone who wants to ask a question, feel free to put it into the app. Um, but while we were waiting for some questions to come in, this actually, it made me think of another famous Canadian, Marshall McLuhan, the medium is the message. Yeah. And as your studies have evolved in your first study, you really found that the medium was so important. Mm -hmm. And then as your studies are evolving, yeah. It's how the messaging, how do you, if you, if you look back and think about that, you know, he wrote about this in what, the late fifties, early sixties. Mm -hmm. And if you think about how advanced this is, what do you think in terms of modern communications and what we're seeing today, how important is the medium versus the message? I still think medium's key. Like, of course the message, like I said, that message um, with the experiment that I did, it's important. But if you're not using the right channels to get that message out there, then the per your audience isn't receiving it. So the medium is still key. The medium is more important than the message. Absolutely. Um, if you say something on Instagram, you're only reaching a very small audience. If you're saying something on Twitter, you're still only reaching a small audience on Facebook. You're only reaching those who follow you and you're hoping that people share that information. So it's important. The medium is definitely, I think, more important than the message, particularly with social media. So is a future research direction you might be thinking about Talk, looking at different messages on different platforms and seeing how people react to them based on different. That so, could be interesting. So it's I the same message happen on Facebook versus Instagram. So it might be the empathetic message works better on Instagram versus the more direct message works better on Facebook. I like that idea. <laughs> I'm going to take that. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, I was thinking also more uh, different formats as well. So um, more of a visual like photo with the information versus just regular text and seeing whether different platforms are better with the visuals, which we know we've done that in marketing research. We know that um, Instagram and we know that of course, Facebook works better with visuals, but in terms of crises, are people going to perceive that message as being uh, less impactful if it's maybe blown up as a photo, right? People might not take it as seriously if it's a picture than if it's text providing information. So I think that's kind of the next direction I was going with, but Oh, that's I love that idea in terms of testing that same message on different platforms because of course as you saw I did on Facebook and I yeah. didn't do it across different ones mm -hmm. and one the other thing I was thinking about while you were going through and you know you, you stimulated a lot of great thought was one of going back to the original work sort of from the 70s and 80s in this hospitality the old Mansfield stuff and the the old Seville Somnet stuff how would you say that communication has evolved over the last 20 years, you know, because back back in the days of the 70s and 80s, like the hijackings and stuff like that, when they're doing that, you'd have like, it would be on, it would be on the news for a very short time if you, you weren't in a direct area and it just wasn't covered. But I remember, 
a few years ago, I was in China with students and they came knocking on my door at like midnight, going, turn on the thing. And the Charleston, you know, the Ema Mother Emanuel shooting was on Chinese TV. <laughs> and it was on for like two or three days afterwards. So a place I would never, you know. So how do, how do you think the messaging has evolved? And do you think it's gonna get increasingly complex for destinations to be able to share messages? I think that's the reason that in the early research I was doing that we found that they weren't communicating at all. I think the reason for that was because they understand that any message that gets out there nowadays can escalate to a global scale, right? So as you mentioned, something that happens in the US can get all the way into China. And every, something that happens in one destination can be in people, because of things like social media and the internet, we understand that on a global scale that everyone across the wor world can um, get that same message. Everyone ever was watching the US election recently as well. They were watching it here, they're watching it there as well. So that same message gets everywhere. So I think that a lot of organizations are starting, especially in tourism, who relies on a global audience is being a little bit more cautious about what they say, because maybe they aren't aware of that a hurricane's in Florida. And if they say something about it, people who are listening all the way in, let's say like Russia or China are thinking, well, I don't want to go there. There's hurricanes there all the time, right? So they're maybe avoiding that that communication um, for that reason. So I think it is extremely complex. And that's why I think it's so important to think about the message itself, right? And not just using scare tactics, but trying to do it in a way where we're reducing that, that sense of fear and that increasing their safety and saying, well, you know, they're, they're telling us what's happening, right? Trans or transparency is key. People prefer when organizations um, are as open and transparent as possible. So I think that's the number one message is to don't be afraid to communicate, but do it in a way where, of course, you tread with caution, but yeah. it's still important to say something at the end of the day. Well, I remember down in Charleston, if Jim Cantori was coming to town, we were really, really sad because <laughs> that meant you had a week and it didn't matter if the hurricane hit you or not, you know, that, that it, made, it definitely had an effect. We got some great questions from the crowd here. So yeah. I'm gonna start with the first one. Are hotels using social media for crisis communication now than they were, they were, for example, four years ago in Florida, or is it something you wish your research to achieve? Um, they're still quite silent. And actually, the here's the interesting thing is that hotels, what they usually do is they use a global brand name, right? So you're not following the, uh, what is it, the Chelsea Eaton Hotel in yeah. Toronto. I think it's the Chelsea Eaton um, in Toronto. I could see Tom nodding there. Thank you for that clarification. <laughs> um, it's not, yeah, the so the Chelsea Hotel, maybe they have their own Facebook, yeah. Twitter account, but it's not likely them. It's likely to be, you know, I want to say the Delta because I know it as the Delta Chelsea yeah. That's when I was there, but now it's not the Delta. But let's say the Delta Toronto isn't likely to have their own platform. It's likely to be the global brand of Delta, right? It's not the Marriott um, Garden Hotel, you know, on Queen Street. It's the whole Marriott that's, that's communicating. So they're not really communicating about these incidents on social media because it's the global brand. So something that's localized, a localized incident isn't likely to be communicated to because it's the fact that it's the global brand who's using those communications. However, things like COVID, of course, on a global scale, they are, they are using it, of course, to communicate about COVID information. So currently, because it's such a global pandemic, they are. But if we were to take this back to 11 months ago, um, when COVID wasn't, you know, going across the world, they wouldn't be communicating about the crisis to say. Not all of them. There's some that do it well. And of course, there's millions of hotels out there, but most of them tend to avoid that because the fact that their, their brand communications come from the top down. These global brands are the ones who run the social media pages. Okay. Excellent. Let, let's move on to our next great question. What were the characteristics of your sample for the last experiment, the one about time type message? So what was their sample population for that, do you? Oh, the last experiment? Yes, yeah. okay, so this one we, okay, so I focused the same audience. Um, I should mention, this was part of my dissertation research. So this is the stuff, it's in the, it's in, um, in press. It's gonna be published soon. So I didn't wanna give uh, any uh, citations to it yet. But um, this was focused on terrorism. And so I wanted to look at US tra prospective travelers to London, England, because we focused on a terrorist attack in London. So the characteristics of the sample, actually, I, could, I don't have, I can share my screen here. I have the slide anyways. Um, it was, I actually paid for the sample, I should say. I paid for Qualtrics, it cost way too much money, um, but I paid for the sample and I wanted to make sure it was um, pretty much equal demographics across the board. 
So that's really important. The only other characteristics aside from that, that they have to be a US citizen who has uh, traveled or wants to travel within the next, um, who has traveled in the last 10 years or wants to travel in the next 10 years, because it's a prospective traveler, um, and also that they have to be a social media user. So those are the characteristics. Otherwise, other than that, their um, age range and their um, gender were controlled across the board. Um, and it was pretty equal across in terms of the education as well as income as well. So it was a US representative sample. It was a US representative sample. Yeah, it was a panel data. Excellent. Exactly. It was panel data. Very All right. panel data. <laughs> I just wanted to, okay, the next question was, I wanted to ask if news articles and videos are considered social media communication or is it just for the platforms <laughs> only? And I want to add another thing here. How about YouTube? YouTube is a social media platform, but YouTube's unique because it's not just social media, it's also a search engine. Yeah. So that's where it gets complex. Um, news articles and videos are content that you can put on social media. It's not, it's part of social media communication, but it's, it is a content that you'd post it itself. So the focus, when I say social media, that means the actual platform. But then of course you can have a multitude of different content that you post through that platform, ranging from news articles, videos, uh, images, just basic text, live videos. Um, you can now shop on the platform. So there's a whole bunch of different things you can do on there. But my focus on the media side was looking particularly at all the different media channels that exist or platforms. So, that exist. so you're talking about like the New York Times, it's one of the, one of the people on Facebook and they yeah. post their articles on it. And then what they write with, write with the article that they're posting is the social media con exactly. or social exactly. media message. And, but in the New York Times website itself is not social media because it's their website. Yeah. yeah. All right. You mentioned a delayed response with empathy um, did well with among tourists. What do you, why do you think this is? It almost seems, uh, seems avoidant to me where the crisis is an afterthought. Grace, I completely, I see your name there. I completely agree with you. This was my thought. I was surprised because this went against my entire hypothesis. I'm like, no, they're not gonna care about delayed empathetic messages. They're only gonna care about these immediate informative, informative responses. But at the end of the day, they thought, you know, it increased their perceptions of safety. Um, I, I honestly don't really know. I guess that would be more of a qualitative study I'd have to do and maybe do interviews and ask people why they, are happy with these empathetic messages. I can't really say the reason why it was just the study we did because it is quantitatively focused, but it happened and maybe just kind of thinking at the top of my head, it could just be because um, they felt like they were empathized with, that they were cared for by the tourism industry. Um, and maybe they weren't, I think maybe it could also be a limitation of the experiment that we did because that was the only message they saw. They weren't able to see if the, they communicated prior. I did say in the description, you know, this is the message that they said about the incident and it was delivered one week after. So we kind of controlled for all those different factors, but I don't know. I'm sorry, that's my only answer I can say. <laughs> okay, and one more from the group here. Social media is gonna be the future and is already the present of the industry. What important, um, what important lessons of incorporating social media in your research? So. So what would you say if, if you were talking to a hotel GM or, you know, even a social media manager of, you know, a, a CMO of a Marriott, what, mm -hmm. what lessons do you think your work carries for them? Uh, just to be proactive and not to be delayed. I think one thing that we face a lot in the tourism industry, let's say, of course, I'll focus on your question in a second about the hotels or a CMO of Marriott. But when it comes to the destination itself, they don't always have the resources to communicate, which is a lot of the times why they're not communicating. Um, a lot of them are government organizations, so they may not actually have the ability to hire a full-time social media manager. And I think the key, based on my research and based on um, the research of many others in this area as well, including Dr. Lori Pennington Gray and Ashley Schroeder, is that social media is, should not be an afterthought. It's one of, like I said, it's only, one of the only tools that we can use to communicate in real time to a large audience. So it should not be an afterthought and we should place it as a priority. And one of the main things we should do is implement social media within our crisis communication strategies, within our marketing strategies as well. Um, and so that's kind of the main lesson I would do to anyone in the industry, including if it's somebody, a CMO at the Marriott, or if it's you know a destination management organization who's looking to figure out where their priorities should be. Um, if you're going to incorporate social media within your industry, I think it should be 
at the forefront of your crisis communication practices. Because end of the day, if you're communicating effectively, you're reducing the likelihood that people are um, going to think negatively about your destination if you say nothing at all. Um, back to the question here that they asked about incorporating social media into your research. Uh, it's just so complex. Social media has so many uh, different facets to it that it can be anywhere from like every single channel is different. So I've changed my dissertation like a million times because it was just so complex in order to study in order to study um, social media. Because of course, as you mentioned, Wayne, as well, YouTube, that's just bringing a whole other element into it. It's not, like I said, it's not just a social media platform. It's a search engine. People use it more if they're looking to see like, how do I cook the perfect Thanksgiving turkey? Like I, I did that a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> right? So everyone is using these more for different ways. And I think the most important thing is to understand, first of all, what are people using these platforms mostly for, right? So if we understand why people are using these platforms, which was all part of that research I did with that medium, right? The medium is the message. So if we understand what they're using these platforms for and who the actual people are, who the users are of these different platforms and how their demographics and their behaviors are different based on the platform, then we can actually figure out where our social, social media priorities can be, whether that is on Instagram, because maybe we're targeting more of a 18 to 34 year old audience who loves visuals, or maybe our audience tends to be an older generation. So we want to focus maybe more on Facebook. And yeah, so it's a long winded answer. I apologize. For that. <laughs> no, what's really interesting about this, and I think this is the thing that's fascinating about this, and I hope a lot of people get this is, you know, you just started your career as a full-time professor and out of your research, you probably have five, 10, 15 years worth of questions still to answer. And it's just the start and it's not, it's definitely not the end of a great sort of field of research. And I, you know, I was reading some of your work on festivals and social media, and that's a whole area that there's some excellent work to be done in there and so useful for the industry considering a year like this as well. Yeah. Um, we are getting to the end of our time, so I just wanted to thank you so much for your presentation today and sharing your insights and everything with us and participating in the Q&A. As a commercial, our next edition of Compass is on November 24th at 3 p.m. featuring Tr Trevor Jonas Benson and Camille Montoya Guevara from the Culinary T Tourism Alliance. They'll be sharing case studies of some of the food tourism development work they have done for destinations in Canada, as well as internationally in Scotland. You can register via the link that will be sent in chat or by scanning the QR code displayed on the screen. Be sure to follow us on social media, visit our website and subscribe to our newsletter to stay updated on future events and other announcements from the Institute for Hospitality and Tourism Research. Thank you for joining us today. And we hope to see you at our next virtual event and Let's just give a big thank you and rounds of applause to Danielle for a wonderful presentation. And we thank you so much for your spending your time with us and spent, in your case, spending the evening with us. Yes, it's now six o'clock, so I'm gonna go have my dinner, but thank you all so much. Uh, it was great to be back um, as part of Ryerson. And yes, yeah, great to see or have a lot of you here that I know very well. So it was great. Thank you so much for having me. Daniela, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Sanlu. <laughs> so where are you now? You're in Toronto or you in UK? I'm in Newcastle. Yeah, I'm in the UK.